All right, welcome back. This is episode 89 of the Unsecurity Podcast. I'm your host this week, Brad and I. Today is July 20th, and joining me this morning, as usual, is Evan Francine. Morning, Evan. Hey, good morning, Brad. How are you? Good. Well, I guessed RV trip, but it was a trip. I, wasn't, I wasn't totally off. No, I just didn't bring the big trailer with. Yeah. So we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, today, we have our sixth guest in the Women in Security series, and the second from outside of FR Secure, Judy Hatchett. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Brad. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. You haven't seen the notes, but I said you were going to say something positive or funny. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? It's Monday and it's not raining. How's that? There we go. <laughs> I, heard, I heard the weather was bad here this weekend, so... Yeah, we had some pretty bad storms up here. But luckily, it missed the where we where I live, but just north of the city has had some really nasty storms. All right, so before we get going, uh, recap the week, Evan. I, yes, I mentioned on there. I don't think we talked at all. Did we talk last week after the podcast? Maybe one day. I don't. I, yeah, I don't remember talking to you last week. I don't even remember your face until you just showed it. <laughs> Maybe Tuesday Beard, Beard's morning. looking good. What's that? Maybe Tuesday morning. Yeah, maybe. So, what happened last week? What did you do this weekend? Last week was really good. Uh, had a good meeting with Chubb Insurance on the S2Me. I think uh, there's a pilot coming for that. Uh, you know, that's the personal information security risk assessment tool. Uh, another good meeting. Uh, oh, you remember our guest from a couple weeks ago, Kristen Judge? Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're still continuing conversations about um, partnering uh, to try to help the cybercrime support network. Oh, very cool. Uh, the security shit show on Thursday, if you, if you missed it, was awesome. Uh, it was Chris Roberts' uh, topic, and we talked about hiring practices and how mm. um, we kind of screwed that up a lot. And then yeah. Saturday at about 10 o'clock at night, uh, we've been shopping, you know, we, we, we lost Vike last week. And so we've been kind of like coping. And then towards the end of the week, we're like, we should get another dog. We should try to find another breed like him. He was a Chorky. Uh, so my wife was shopping online, you know, Craigslist nationwide. And then uh, she kind of really, really liked this little two and a half pound. She's 12 weeks old, two and a half pound teacup thing. And uh, so Saturday night at about 10, Walked in the house from like I went to the I don't know some, one of the stores or something, and I said uh, I'm just gonna go get her. And so I drove straight through, uh, fueled by energy drinks. Drove straight through to Indiana, uh, picked her up, brought her home. Got home last night about 11:30. It's my life, man. That's how I do things. Yeah, I. I... <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine doing. I've been, you, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how you're functioning this morning. I don't either, man. I don't know how I function most days. <laughs> but you talked about that storm. I ran into that twice. You know, I ran into that storm on the way out uh, mm -hmm. in Wisconsin, about middle of Wisconsin. Yeah. I ran into that storm coming back again, uh, just this side of like Indianapolis. Oh, yeah. I bet that was not fun to drive, drive through. And... Yeah. How about your weekend? And we got asked about Judy's weekend too. Yeah, well, listen, Judy, go. You can go next, Judy. How was, um, how was your weekend? Oh, I did a lot of screen. I went shield time too this weekend. I was saying earlier, um, my son had a lacrosse tournament in uh, Racine, Wisconsin, which is just like south of Milwaukee. So we left Thursday night and uh, games Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We got home last night around eight o'clock. So it was super busy. I get really tired when I drive that much. So I don't even know how you did it, Evan, because I could never do 11 hours in a row. So it's his next tournament's in Indiana. And I said, uh, no, you're not going because I'm not driving that far. <laughs> well, if he needs a ride. Maybe it's like, <laughs> if he needs a ride and you trust me, you know, there's room. Oh, of course, of course. But no, it was really busy, long days. And um, we didn't have, I mean, we had some humidity and we got, Milwaukee got hit um last or like the early sunday morning probably around three the storm that hit here in minneapolis 
So it was when we got hit, but um, it was just super muggy and we had a breeze, which was fairly nice, but you know, when it's a warm muggy breeze, it's nothing to cheer about. So uh, just was really making sure that the kids stay hydrated and like I had my truck parked right at the field. So Garth could get off and come right in the truck and cool down and then go play again. So yeah. Good tournament. Yeah, they took second. It was a really good tournament, really good tournament. There had to have been over 40 teams there. It was a, uh, it's all club lacrosse teams of all ages, like from 10 up through 17, 18. And uh, he plays on the 21, 2021 team, which is 17, 18 year olds. And uh, they took second. So it was a really good game. It's, he's going to be sore today, but it was really good games, really good tournament. So awesome. you know, lacrosse is a brutal sport. Oh my gosh. It's um, you know, this is field. He played box in February and I'll tell you box is 10 times worse than field box is like you have a stick and it's just a weapon <laughs> so, wow. so yeah it was good it was good it's good to spend time with them awesome well, i'm glad you made it home safely brad how was your weekend it was good just kind of hung around did some yard work saturday was yeah it was like 94 95 with like 75 percent humidity it was like you walk outside and just yeah it was sticky and gross so we just kind of Hung around, played some games in the house, and yeah, just, this, just took it easy. It's kind of nice. Yeah, I was out working in the yard on Saturday morning. So Saturday morning, I didn't leave till Saturday night. But Saturday morning, I was out working in the yard, and I had a surprise visit from Joe and and mm. uh, Danielle. Very it's cool. my old second, third, third youngest, oldest son, whatever. And so they just show up and I'm like just drenched in sweat. I was working on the deck. So, you know, I was all muddy and yeah, it's a bad time to come say hi. Yeah. Yesterday was pretty nice. It was pretty breezy, but cooler and not bad. So yeah, did did a bunch of yard work and it's kind of, yeah, spent, like I said, spend time with the family. It's kind of, kind of nice to have a down weekend. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> what is it like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Luckily. Brad, well, that's one of the things I've always, I really admire about you, Brad, honestly, and, and I was saying this as a friend, uh, just how you do a good job of setting an example of work-life balance. You're good at that. I, it's a it's a very deliberate thing because, yeah, I used to, before kids, would work all weekend, but I remember, yeah, growing up and uh my dad was a CPA in tax season from like February through April. Just didn't see him. So want to make it better. Um, yes. Deliberate. You get a women in security. We had our wives on back in episode. Like yeah, that was way, that was a long time ago. Yeah. They told so, the I've, so I missed two episodes. I didn't realize I missed two. I know you guys were talking about oh, either no. your wives this is back this wasn't part of the series this was oh. back in like i don't know man it must have been like episode in the 20s maybe yeah 20, 25 something like that yeah and they told the truth I was like, <laughs> Duh. but i was actually thinking about that though yesterday you know it's this whole women in security that your spouses really are women in security as well because your wives just like my husband you know our jobs are seven by 24 365 and it's tough sometimes it's really mm -hmm. tough. Truly, so, yeah. That was one of the biggest sacrifice. Yeah, it was one of the things my wife mentioned is she's a nurse, and when she leaves, she's done. Right? She thinks about her patients and cares about them, but she's done. She's, yeah. You know, we we never are off. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. All right. All right. So we'll get started. Um, six week. This is really been just really enlightening i think like i said last time we are starting to see some i don't know commonalities some trends evan i think um so far so i'm i'm curious to see if uh judy has the had the same insights or experiences oh evan's evan's muted sorry about that yeah I was going to say, well, first I, I said something kind of funny. I was like, oh, we'll see if Judy's an outlier, but then it's not funny anymore because we're out of context. <laughs> uh, but the other thing is, I was thinking, what's one thing, can you think of one thing that kind of just sticks out as that you've learned? 
you know, in the five that we've had so far? I think the biggest surprise to me is the how how women, if they're not a hundred percent confident, they don't go for it, right? They have that kind of like I don't know, self doubt or whatever. Whereas guys are like, like you said, you you describe yourself as reckless, borderline, <laughs> borderline. Uh, but yeah, guys are like, eh, let's see what happens, and, and that doesn't. That I was really surprised to hear that 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 is not at all. It's the complete opposite. Yeah, and, and, and as I look back in the episodes, like, you know, because it was 84, 85, 86, 87, and then this is, I don't know, in 88, and then this is episode 89 with Judy. I learned something from every one, but I, there is, like, a common thread, I think, of mm-hmm. – um, it started with Renee. Renee, you know, said that she's had to be really strong and confident, and uh, and I think for her and maybe for many of the women, if not all of them – that's been something that they've had to consciously, you know, sort of, mm-hmm. you know, emphasize. Whereas I just, you know, I look back and I didn't, I didn't really have to focus on that at all. Yeah. I, I fully agree. But yeah. I mean, crazy. Awesome people with Renee, uh, Lori. I, I didn't know that Lori had been in information security from, she's in episode 85 mm-hmm. since 1985. I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and she still is giving me grief about the 20 year thing. Right. Uh, 20 years. Yeah. I did that in 2005. Thanks pal. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Victoria, the one thing that stands out with the talk with her was how that recruiter said that. Recruiter, to her. Yeah. That said, was shocking. Oh my gosh. Right. Oh, I would have, I just, I was listening to that one and it was just shocking. I'm just like, Oh my gosh. What yeah. a, I mean, I can't imagine how she felt. That was just horrible. So, but and she seemed to kind of just roll leave, off. Let her, yeah, and I think that'll serve her well. She's uh, she's definitely an up and comer. I'm excited to see where where her mm-hmm. career goes. Mm-hmm. She seems uh, very eager, mm-hmm. which is amazing. I mean, she's she yeah. wants to she wants to learn, which is amazing. So that's that's always a good yeah. talent. Yeah, she's fun to work with. Well, I'm thinking as a security person, when you have that kind of. Uh, that personality, that magnetic kind of personality and communication style, uh, it brings people in. And, you know, mm-hmm. we, we try to do that so much with security. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kristen, just her path was interesting to me, how she had come from uh, an elected official, right, as mm-hmm. a, a county commissioner. Yeah. Yeah. And now she's running a nonprofit. She's run her own consulting company. She's worked at uh, you know, the National Cyber Security Alliance and just yeah. really cool. And then Andrea. Her, her edge, oh, Christ, Christine's uh, um, education awareness around how to train and then, you know, and our, just listening to her, very passionate about if you don't train them, it's going to happen again to them. And that's the biggest thing for them is take advantage. You guys, I think both of you guys has had, and she did too, is take advantage of unfortunate, an unfortunate incident that happened, but take advantage to train them and teach them. So yeah. that doesn't happen again. Yeah, she had that one saying, what was it? Uh, oh, crud, I can't remember. I took my notes somewhere yeah. else. But, yeah. I actually but, wrote it down, too. <laughs> I can't remember it. We should pay attention more, shouldn't we, Brad? One of them was never waste a good breach. I'm trying to remember the other one was. So, But something was along those same lines. It was like, the best time to teach is after a breach. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, she's awesome. And, and it's cool that we were you know, we still have conversations, you know, outside of this in just ways that we can work and make a difference together. Uh, and then Andrea, yeah. you know, where's she going to go? I mean, that, that girl's got some amazing potential. Yeah. Oh, oh man. I, I pulled an Evan. I forgot to mute my phone. Oh yeah. I have a phone. Usually it was you that did the uh, audio when we were doing <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah, I was, re- I was really impressed with Andrea. She's going to be, uh, like I said, it's going to be fun to watch where she goes in her career. Yeah. Yeah. Sky's the limit for her. And then one of my, and Judy, and I'm not saying this just cause you're on the show. I've said this to numerous people. Uh, you're one of my favorite security people because you're a down to earth person that I can, when I talk to you, uh, it's just like, it's just like a conversation, mm-hmm. but yet. You've got this awesome experience and this background 
So I'm really happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, I, I've been in a couple different industries and I'm currently now the CISO at SureScripts, which is uh, it's the largest health IT network that links every physician, clinician, and pharmacist. So we basically we got rid of all of the paper that you would use to go and get your pharmacy uh, prescriptions filled. And so our network um, is amazingly, it's, it's huge. I mean, last year we delivered 1.79 billion prescriptions across wow. our network. Yeah. Wow. And 2.8 or 2.18 uh, billion medical history responses. So we do med history as well that were delivered from pharmacy to pharmacy. And then um, 333.8 million links to clinical document sources that we shared across our network. Wow. Yeah. So for a uh, mid-sized company and we have a very, very large uh, health network. So I'm as close to being part of the healthcare critical infrastructure as you could possibly be. So just, just a little bit of PHI. Yeah, just a little bit. So and previous to that, I was at Fairview Health Services as our CISO and previous to that, I was at 3M. So manufacturing and healthcare are very similar, but been doing information security for almost 15 to 20 years and uh, retail and manufacturing and now healthcare. And it's, it, it's interesting to see how some things change and some things never do. Um, yeah. But uh, it's, it's been fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I'm very honored to be here today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so you, you mentioned a little bit that you know maybe tell a little bit about how you got into information security where how did where did you come from and yeah so i um i actually kind of stumbled into information security i was a director at the regional multiple listing service of their it department and um, had been working a ton of hours. <laughs> this is really actually kind of funny retrospect. Worked a ton of hours and got burnt out and just left without having a job. I was, I'd had two children under the age of three and I was incredibly fried. And um, my husband had said to me, hey, you can make more money working at McDonald's and plus you'd have a uniform. You can bring food home for us at the end of the day. <laughs> and um, I started a contracting uh, gig at Best Buy doing their identity and access management RFP work. And literally, and that was right when uh, PCI was just taking off. It was still called IT general controls at that time. And I got in at that point and found a passion. And um, uh, I had to leave Best Buy because Accenture came in and the group that I was with, the consulting group that I was with, was not part of their preferred vendor list. And so I went back into the banking industry and did uh, program management and realized that I really didn't like software development. It was very boring to me. And after two years, Best Buy called back and said, Eric Center called back and said, hey, we got a position in PCI doing PCI recertification. And it was in their network space. And so did network access controls, network segmentation. And for anybody that is ever thinks that network segmentation is easy. It's not. I've had many, many sleepless nights uh, in a retail industry where if you can't ring up a cash sale or if your application isn't working, you've got to figure out why. And um, I think developers have gotten a lot better about understanding how their applications work and understanding which ports they talk on. But I will tell you, you know, this was 10 years ago and they're like, well, I don't know what port it's talking on. So then you rely on the firewall engineers to figure out what's blocking it. And then you open up one and then you find out, oh no, there's another port that's gonna to talk to another server. And it's um, many, many, many sleepless nights. It's a lot of trial and error. And um, it was very challenging, but very rewarding, learned a ton. Uh, and that led into a really good career around PCI. And I've actually had the opportunity to sit in and represent an organization as part of a PCI accreditation, um, listening to the PCI QSA um, at that point before I became a CISO and listening to all the different questions and answers and what you can and cannot say uh, during those, those, uh, those interviews. And um, was at Best Buy for about eight years doing everything from PCI to IT general controls to identity and access management. Found out that I actually have a passion for identity and access management. Love how complex it is and how you peel back all the layers of the onion. Uh, implemented some really uh, good solid programs there and also had SAP security. So I learned a lot about SAP security. Had an amazing boss who's still a really good mentor of mine, uh, John Valente. And he actually was a very, he believed in having women in security. He believed that uh, I needed to have a mentor. So I had a really strong mentor um, that he had found for, helped me find at Best Buy, which helped was, was amazing. 
Um, and then John left Best Buy and uh, Deb Dixon came back, another amazing woman in information security. She was Best Buy's first CISO and uh, she came back in and a really good leader, really good program. She's actually the first one that um, had taken information security out of IT and put it under finance. So when she came back in, she said, we're gonna to report to finance, get out of IT so that we're not the fox watching the in-house kind of deal. So it was really, really interesting. Um, and then uh, left there, went to super value and did identity and access management, challenging environment, realized it wasn't quite a good fit. And then uh, John was over at 3M as their CISO and uh, took a role under John and doing an international, another international program for um, information security, working with the health information systems team. You probably don't think of 3M as having a lot of uh, PHI data, but they have a very large health information systems group. Uh, they actually write the code for when you go to the doctor's office and you have um, an illness and they say, well, this is these symptoms. We think it's this IDC9 code or ICD9 code. That's what gets billed to your insurance company. They actually write that and do that correlation. So they have a lot of payer provider relationships. Um, had just a really great uh, program there, really great opportunity working with uh, their aviation department, doing international work with them, building out programs. Um, and then the CISO opportunity at Fairview came up again, even at 3M had a really strong mentor and she knew nothing about information security, which was great because if I would, I would bring her presentations, if she could understand it, I wasn't doing my job. So when we, when we first met, she was like, I don't know what I have to offer you. And I said, oh, you have the, the information, you have the 3M background. I said, you can help me make sure that I'm articulating what I need to articulate. And we actually worked out really well. It was a really good relationship that we had. So strong mentorship, again, a really good leader underneath uh, John. And, and then at Fairview, um, it was, again, a, an opportunity to build a program and have really good executive leadership sponsorship. So um, part of it is just you know, getting in and having some really good leadership that can uh, oversee what you're doing and, and get behind what you're doing and help promote what you're doing. So, um, but it was really, I stumbled into it pretty much <laughs> a long yeah. time ago. It, I mean, it's kind of how, what happened for me as well. It's kind of interesting that, you know, how many people that we meet in security just kind of are like, yeah, I, I just was doing it and realized, yeah, I like doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you, I like when you break down information security versus like socks, information security, I mean, there's some gray spaces in there, but socks is incredibly complicated. So anytime I have socks responsibilities, I get a little stressed out <laughs> because your auditors can play a lot of games with you. So yeah. so I told you she had a lot of experience, Brad. I, I didn't I didn't argue that. I worked as <laughs> I knew that. Well, he, he was like, no, she doesn't. I was like, no. Why are we um, having her on? Really? <laughs> she grilled me. <laughs> I kind of did. <laughs> That's one of the cool things about the path, though. The path that people take through. In there is, and this was something we talked about on the on the security shit show on Thursday too. Is there's no one path, you know? Mm -hmm. There's so many paths into this industry, and I think one of the reasons why that's true is, you know, so many things fit into a bucket. You know, like finance fits into a finance bucket. And mm -hmm. Security is just one of those things where it, it, it doesn't really fit into a bucket. It's in every bucket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, really. Uh, I will say, I honestly thought when I was doing my early PCI work, I thought that you had to be in being able, you had to do AV, you had to do, you know, you had to be very technical. You had to have that incident response background to be able to be anything in information security. And I will tell you along my journey, I have proven that is not the case time and time and time again. And um, Lori actually brought it up on, on, you know, your, on your second session, but uh, Lori, Lori Blair, give her a huge shout out. She was great. I reached out to her and she sat down with my interns. My intern had the same concern that I had years ago is I'm not technical. And um, it doesn't matter. Like you said, you don't have to fit into a specific bucket. There are so many different things within information security that you can do that you and you don't have to have a specific background. Um, you you can have a finance background. You can have a legal background. You can have a computer science background. You know you can have all these different backgrounds to fit into it. It's not something that you actually have to meet these requirements one through ten before you get in. 
Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that I think is so great is is with like Lori and that is that you should bring such a different perspective because I do come from a more technical background mm -hmm. and I, I don't know, I would totally rely on her for some of that governance and interpretation of some of those those types of things. I, it, it's just such a huge help. There's enough room in this industry for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. So, wow, man, there are just so many, so many interesting areas that you've worked in. Um, On big companies too, right? Yeah, I know. I, the, the, I think that's probably the, so talk maybe a little bit about, you know, your experience as, as a woman in those bigger companies, you know, we, we, we heard um, kind of that bro culture has been brought up a couple of times. Have you seen that? Have you? I have, I actually have, I won't say where, um, but I have, and it was shocking. Um, and it was later on in my career when I experienced it. And um, I had heard about it from being a part of a um, women in leadership group at that particular company. And, but had never experienced it. And then one day I was sitting in a meeting and I was one of two females in the meeting and the, it happened where the guys talked over me or they literally had their back to me. Like we were sitting around a conference table, but they would turn their chair and have their back to me and not acknowledge when I was saying something. And it was shocking because um, I had really honestly never experienced it to that degree. And, um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it really, I walked away going, wow, that was really crappy. <laughs> yeah. And then trying to think of how, how you can address that going forward rather than like, cause I kind of retreat a little bit cause I just was so shocked. I'd never had it that blatantly in my face before. Um, and I dealt with, you know, you are, you, it's a female in this industry. You deal with men all the time. And um, I don't disagree. You have to be confident. You have to be assured what you're saying and you have to be credible. Um, and it, and sometimes, and also the other thing is, is, uh, and this is what I loved about, you know, uh, my mentor, John Valente, he was so understanding. I'd walk into his office literally and I would go, okay, John, how do I say this without sounding bitchy? Because if you say it, you're going to be fine. But if I say it, it's going to come out wrong. So help me understand how I can say this. And the first couple of times he would, he, he would laugh and he'd joke. And then he, he really got to understand that it's, it's different for women when, and how you come across and how you state things. And um, it's tough to be assertive and aggressive sometimes um, as a female, because you do come across as being bitchy and, um, but it's different if a man says it. So. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, it makes sense, but yeah, I never. I, I, well, we don't see it from that. Yeah, you know, we don't see it from those eyes. But do, do you think men get a get a pass on certain things more in business, or maybe that's a tough question? Uh, it depends on the culture, honestly, okay. and it depends on the organization. Um, I will tell you that SureScripts has a very diverse culture. Um, and a diverse thought process. And I am onboarding into an organization that is very open. And they uh, were just ranked as one of the leading companies to work for um, in the United States. And the I honestly can tell you that in this organization, I have not seen a difference at all. The men are just as understanding and reaching out as the women are and there's this camaraderie there's a um, the word that kept was being used when when um, I was interviewing was people kept saying it's very collegiate and um, but not all organizations are like that and sometimes yes men do do get a pass and um, it's unfair but it, it happens and it depends on if the leader is self-aware to say hey you know you can't do that or hey you know what I think that's wrong um, and addressing it right there rather than addressing it a month or two down the road. So. Yeah. Like I know that there's been a couple of times when Renee has, even personally, I can remember a meeting or two where I just talk, right. I just say my, my thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she said to stop me, said, do you want to rethink about how you said that? <laughs> I was like, 
holy crap, you're right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think it also helps to have somebody hold you accountable because I know that I've, I've interacted with a lot more male leaders than I have female leaders. And I think one of my mentors taught me uh, as I was growing up um, to always consider your audience, right? You speak to your audience, whoever your audience is, right? And so sometimes I forget that I'm not, and, and I think there's, I mean, you, there's always lines you don't cross, but I talk to, you talk to different people in different ways. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you forget about who your audience is too. You know what I mean? I want to show respect to everybody. Everybody deserves respect. Yeah, it's interesting. But I, I do like that we have a, a powerful leader uh, at, at FR Secure who, I mean, she's held, kept me in check a couple times. I appreciate that. <laughs> She has a really good way of delivering that message too. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it is like right in your face. It's like, <laughs> Hey, bam. You know? yeah. She, she, yeah, she knows how to talk to her audience. Mm -hmm. and, I've learned a lot from Renee. She's a fabulous woman. She's uh she's a great partner. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I guess starting out, you know, we had Andrea on last week, who's a senior in college. Um, what advice would you have for, you know, anybody looking, you know, either young or, you know, like Victoria, where she changed professions, um, changed careers. What, what advice would you have for, for someone looking to get into information security? Uh, find a network, build a network and leverage that network. I will tell you, I didn't do that early on. And um, I think it hurt me a little bit. Um, I love where I'm at. I love where I'm at in my career. But I often think of if I really would have just leveraged that network and trusted those people that were really levered, you know, leaning out and saying, here, go look at this or, hey, come here and, you know, come to this session or come to this happy hour or do this. Not that it's always the happy hour, but sometimes vendors would offer out to say, hey, come and participate in this. And I never did that. And you don't you don't get to build your network that way. And if you build your network and you rely on your network, that network's going to help you. And there's going to always be opportunities that come up um, that you say, hey, you know what? I thought of this one person. I think I'm going to reach out and just connect those two people. And it's so powerful. Um, and that's, it's, it's, and the other thing is, is don't be shy. Don't be shy about what you may have or what you may think you don't have. Ask questions. Um, there's no such thing as a dumb question. The dumb question is a question that was never asked. Um, and everybody's always going to at least try to help you out. But having that network, building that network, taking advantage of the people that are reaching out and say they really want to help you, um, by all means, rely on those people because it, it does pay off. And um, what I'm doing now is just like with Lori, I reached out to Lori and had her talk to my intern because I want to be able to help those, those women that are just getting into security, no matter what their age is, but wherever they're at. And I still stay in contact with my intern that I had at 3M. She's in her master's program. I wrote her a letter of recommendation uh, for her master's program because she was such an amazing excuse me, amazing intern. And um, it just, you, you get them introduced to different people, different walks of life and give them all different kinds of choices to determine where they want to go. Um, the other thing is, is become part of some organizations like WESIS, you know, Women in Cybersecurity um, or other areas that will also help you build that network and give you some exposure, at least um, get to know people and hear what other people are doing. So do you think the Part of the issue, maybe, you know, we talked about how women maybe are a little bit more hesitant and have to be very confident. Do you think building that network is somehow related, right? You don't feel like you or you're, I, I don't know what the right word is, but do you think that plays part of it? I think the right word was pizza. <laughs> I think it definitely does, Brad, um, because you find out you're not alone in what you're feeling or what you're thinking. And women, I mean, men do it too, but I think the men camaraderie is much different than a women's camaraderie. The women, how women build each other up. And I think um, it's just, it's, we are made up differently. And so we think differently in some instances, we feel things differently. Um, we come across differently and having that network of women um, and also men that are part of that network as well. Like in our WESIS group, we've got a man that comes, it actually is kind of an adjunct board member. And 
it's really interesting to hear his, his perspective. He actually has uh, two or three daughters. So um, it's, it's really interesting. But um, I do think that that helps because you just realize you're not alone. You've got somebody in and say, hey, you know, you can call them and say, this person just did this. Can you believe it? And they're like, oh yeah, that's happened to me. And you just, it's just easier to deal with and easier to cope with sometimes when you do get some of those blows every now and then. Well, I think for me, I mean, even for guys, like, you know, like you were sort of alluding to, too, um, having that safety net. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, guys, sometimes, you know, we like to be all macho and uh, who, needs, <laughs> who needs a safety net? Well, that's pride. And the sooner you can beat the crap out of that, the better. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we all do need to. I mean, I've, I've got my safety network. And Brad, I'm sure you do, too. People that you can go run to. Yeah. yeah it was interesting as you were talking about the building out the network younger and I very much can relate to that you know I I probably shot myself in the foot career-wise a couple of times not taking advantage of it uh, for whatever you know that reason is oh I was just gonna say just so for women just starting out build that network yeah Mm -hmm. yeah take the time you have to input some time it just doesn't happen overnight you have to take time to make those connections and invest yourself into that network. And um, you, you can't be afraid. You got to like just jump in and it's not ever perfect, but you know what? It, it really pays off tenfold to have those relationships. And, and it's, it's females, it's males, it's, um, you know, but you just really got to build that network. And some of it, for some of us, it doesn't come natural either. Yeah. Oh, I'm, like I said, it's not easy. And I think that's, you know, once I got over that hurdle of it's going to be all right, it, it's, I, I am just amazed at the people that I have met and the doors that they have opened to meeting other people. Um, like who would have, I would have never thought that five years ago where I'm today and I was having a conversation with the interim CISO from Slack last week or two weeks ago, you know, and, um, you know, and having a conversation with the, the CISO from um, Cisco this afternoon. She's actually a native Minnesotan and she's a fabulous woman, very powerful leader. And she is giving me her time just to have a conversation and help figure out a few things. And it's, it's just because somebody else opened the door and said, hey, Judy, I really think you should meet this person. So, cool. yeah, it's very cool. I mean, heck, Evan, I mean, it's weird for me that we've got like, Judy on and Kristen came on and so top notch top quality people yeah regardless of gender um, you know obviously the topic you know the we're focusing on women because I think we want to empower more women we need more you know we just need more difficult problems require creative solutions and a lot of times when you have these different views on things it just makes your solution that much better uh, so wherever there's an inequality and you know, those words have been kind of stolen for a lot of other agendas and biases and whatever, but we do have inequality in things are off balance and, you know, hopefully yeah. we're trying to correct that a little bit. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean like this for where I'm at at church, this is the first time um, I have not had a female directly reporting to me and I only have with counting my intern, actually now I have a contractor I have three females on my team and um, it, it's, it's different having four males report to me and without having that female at that leadership level level. And they're all great guys. I mean, amazing guys they are super smart at what they do. Um, and, but I really am, I really want to look for that diversity across the organ, you know, across my team. But again, I don't want to hire a female for the sake of hiring a female. I want to hire the person that's right for the job. And so a very smart woman told me what they do at their organization is they take the names off the resumes. When the resumes come in, the names are off. And so you are really just looking at the skills of that person. You don't even know anything else about that person. You don't know their name. You don't know their address. You don't know anything that would identify who they are. Um, And she said it has been very eye-opening for them to interview and choose candidates that way. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah, it's a really good idea. Mhm. Mhm. So. Well, so with that, do you you know do you think we need more women in the industry? You know, you said this is the first time you haven't had a woman directly reporting to you. 
are you seeing you know a shortage oh by all means i think there are i think there are definitely a, a shortage of women there's a shortage in the of talent in the information security space across the united states anyway but definitely a shortage of women and i think um again it goes back to some if you if you're not in a certain skill set they feel oh i can't do that and that's not the case and i think that's what we need to keep spreading the word about is that it, it, it's all walks of life that come into information security and to get those girls into the elementary i know brad you're doing some work into the school systems and helping them understand that it's it's a really cool um vocation to get into and it's a great career path and any analytical skills and you know type of process flows and you know, write technical writing or even writing in general will get you in through that program and it, it's going to be very rewarding for them. So yeah, I, I definitely feel there is a shortage of women in information security. It's, it's tough. It's tough. So yeah, even like PR and marketing, yeah, we were talking about uh, a friend of mine is uh, does marketing and PR work very, very talented. And, uh, and I was saying you should build a, business on this how many CISOs wouldn't like to be viewed in a more positive light in the organizations they work within and uh, getting the message out in a more creative sticky mm -hmm. way I'm like we could totally use that in security yeah yeah I will tell you that you know some kids still think that information security when I talk with even like my teenage son and his friends they think, you know, hacking, that's all they think of. They don't think of the other components around it. Um, my daughter actually, she wants to go into forensic science. And so she doesn't, yeah, it's very cool. Um, but, you know, you talk to some of these other girls and they're so smart and they're so talented, but they just, you gotta kind of point them in some of these different areas that gives them that exposure. And that's why these STEM programs are so important. Do you think a lot of women maybe just people in general, actually. I mean, it may not be a man, woman thing, but sort of talk themselves out of going into this industry because of that. You know, you think that, well, I gotta be, you know, I, it, I don't know computers well. So they just, just kind of check it off their list and go somewhere else. I think so. I mean, I think so. Yeah. They don't know where to begin. I think you had made reference in one of the, one of the other previous episodes that people always point people to the help desk. And that's not the case. I mean, you can, right. you can bring somebody in as an associate analyst, like what you guys have in your program to get them started out um, and get them just to, to, to dabble in it a little bit. They don't always have to start out at a help desk or at a systems operations center type role. You can bring them into your program really early on. Yeah, I think it's, it's that, but not knowing exactly where to turn. And that support network would help a lot too. Mm -hmm. So really good advice on that. Yeah, because maybe their resume doesn't say that exactly who that person is. I mean, resume is just a bunch of words on a piece of paper that you know you try to figure out what that person's about. But if you have somebody that can vouch for you and says, hey, this person is, has done this, they've done this, they're a really great go-getter, they, they can communicate, they know how to navigate complex processes, you know, something like that. Anybody that can help vouch for you does have its weight as well for sure so i guess along those lines you know what can we do better you know to get more women or just more talented people i, I think this is this is a great thing i mean i actually gave the podcast out to a couple of different women and told them to go listen to it because i said i think it was really great you guys um, are very lighthearted and but serious in the same sense because it's, it's a very interesting podcast to listen to um, but different programs like what we're doing for the Minnesota Cybersecurity Summit last year, we did a women in cyber half day session and uh, Leanne from your staff is part of that, that group as well. And that was a very, I was so pleased in putting that, helping putting that program together with Tina Meeker and Eileen and a bunch of other very fabulous women. Um, we had, you know, half hour panel sessions break and we, the beginning of those sessions, the room was about three quarters full. By the time 1130 came around that there was standing room only in that room. And it was just a really good trying out rave reviews. So we're doing that again. And so I think organizations that can get behind those type of local programs are really helpful. Um, getting involved in some of the other national programs that are out there like Women in Cyber Oasis. Uh, we actually just started up a Minnesota chapter here. 
Mm. Um, we're just kicking that off. We're partnering with the Minnesota Cybersecurity Summit to do that for that four hour half day session here in October. Um, I think Executive Women's Forum, I've heard that mentioned a couple times on your programs as well. That's another really good program, uh, national program as well. Um, and then just giving the opportunity or having um, discussions, maybe like I know it's like some of the women that are CISOs, they run women in leadership programs at their company. And that also gives, and whether it's a book club or they meet once a month and have different topics, whatever that may be, um, that's also really important to have to help build that network internally, if the organization is large enough, does maybe it doesn't even have to be a large organization. I know I had that at one of the organizations I was at, um, and it, it gives women the opportunity to share. And also, you learn about other opportunities when you again you're building that network inside your organization. Whether you want to stay inside that organization or go outside, you're building that network. So sometimes having those type of programs internally um, are beneficial. One thing we've learned is. You have to be deliberate. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, in our leadership at, you know, in our company, we, uh, we recognize we were all, you know, we have said it, you know, kind of lots of times we were all sitting around the room, the leaders, and we're all white men. Mm -hmm. you know, and we're like, anything else? Does it seem kind of dry <laughs> in here? I mean, it seems like we talk about the same things every week. And it's not like we're not talented and smart guys, but it's like we need we need to shake things up. We need to have different perspectives. And you know, and when we brought Renee in, it was like a breath of fresh air. It was like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, the, the flowers blossomed. There's dew on the grass. It's like, <laughs> okay, it's not dry anymore. Yeah. Cool. But but leader, uh, but Evan, that says a lot about you as a leader that you're aware that you need somebody different than you are different than people on your team. And that's sometimes where leaders struggle. They want people like themselves uh, because maybe they're insecure, they have too much pride. They don't wanna let somebody else tell them that what they're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes a really good leader, a strong leader to say, hey, we gotta mix this up a little bit because we have to think differently and not being afraid to bring in that, that amount of change into the organization to get what you need from your leaders or even to have that filter down through. So when you're doing it at the leadership level, it has to filter down through as well um, because that resonates with your employees, that if the employees see that you're um, very consciously aware of the diversity that needs to happen within the organization and promoting that down through within your organization, your employees are gonna be so much more satisfied as an employee working for your organization. And I see that a lot at SureScripts where things that are at the top are filtered all the way down and it's carried all the way down and employees feel empowered and feel um, respected no matter who or what they are. Um, and that's really, really important. Yeah. So for other leaders out there, get people not like you, mm -hmm. you know, if there are gaps, because I think another place we have to go that we haven't really, and it's not so much race, it's more um, just background where you come from. Yep. Yep. Well, I mean, we've talked about it. You, the better, the more background and more diversity, the better your solution is going to be. Like every time, man. If everybody's doing the exact same thing, you're going to make the same mistakes. <laughs> right? I, I, <laughs> That's what it felt like, man. I mean, we were, we were just like, this is really boring. I don't even feel like coming to these meetings anymore. <laughs> well, and then and then we added uh, Vene. Right. Which is yeah. You know, not too confusing. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah Vinay and Renee. Well, and, and the thing about Vinay is not only is she a female, but she's, a, you know, she's our CFO. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I, I, I suck with money, <laughs> you know, and I don't want to talk about money. And so here you got this, you know, we have our weekly meetings, her and I on Tuesday. So tomorrow morning. And uh, we don't even talk about money. I don't want to talk about money. <laughs> In my current role, I actually report to the CFO and she's a female and she's an amazing leader. She's really down to earth. And um, she was one of the one of the executives that really made me want to come to SureScripts because mm -hmm. she had only had the information security team a short time, but she was very in tune as to what information security was all about and what she wanted to see happen with the department, how she wanted to see it grow. 
Um, it wasn't just purely we got to cut dollars cents type of thing. It was here's what we need in the organization. Here's what I see as the CFO. Here's where we need to to pull these different levers to mature the program. So she's a, she's an amazing woman. So really good. Very cool. I have like a dry throat. Hey, I have to point. I, I keep looking at that picture in the background. <laughs> Is that you? That is my daughter. I took that of my daughter and um, I put it up there because it's one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken. It's really cool. And but the thing that uh, is interesting is everybody goes, is that a gun she's holding? I'm like, no, it's bubbles. <laughs> she's sitting on a oh. track and she's holding bubbles and she's got this, you know, bright orange reddish hair and the blue and the black. Oh, it just wow, is cool. crystal clear. Yeah. So the wind's carrying the bubbles. So, yeah. Yeah, because I could see that, but it's a great conversation starter. Because I thought it was a, I thought it was a gun too, and I was like, because she's got this like the same color hair as you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's my daughter when she was about six or seven. So I was taking pictures at my son's lacrosse game, and she was not happy about being there. So she brought something to do, and it was just it was a, one of those opportunities when I was shooting pictures, and it was just really cool. But anybody that knows me knows I have a concealed carry permit. So that's why they always ask, is that a gun? That's really, I'm like, no, it is not. <laughs> it's bubbles. <laughs> we should go shooting sometime, Judy. Myself, John Harmon, uh, we have a bunch of shooters at our, oh, at our work. Most definitely. Most definitely. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. John's a really good shot. Like, really good. Wow. I th you know, because sometimes John, you know John. Yep. You know, yep. he's uh sometimes I just want to call BS. I'm like, mm. so you're saying it was a shooter. This is before I knew. And then we go shooting and I was just like, okay, yeah, you're good. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not that good. So it would, you know, I still practice a lot. So. Yeah. Well, and John, but John's a really good coach too. He's a okay. good, uh, uh, this is, this is like where mentors, mentor, you know, leaders, mentor leaders, you know, in, in a way, cause he was my teacher you know, wow. a lot of shooting tips and things like that. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm. Brad, do you shoot? No, I used to shoot uh, rifles, but yeah, not, not anymore. Not for a I, long time. My wife just got, went to her class for concealed carry, I think last week. So she just needs to go pay the fee and file the papers with the sheriff. Nice. Yeah. Now you're going to have to behave. Oh, she's already got weapons, man. Seriously. <laughs> she doesn't need the gun. <laughs> it keeps you in line. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Oh, man. All right. So kind of went off a little bit there. But, any, you know, any last thoughts, Judy, on anything we've talked about? Anything else you wanted to, to share with us? No, I, I just want to appreciate and give you guys kudos for, I don't know, you know, if you guys came up with this on your own, but having a women in security uh, sessions and, and interviewing all different women across, you know, you start with the women in your organization and then moving across different industries and different walks and where they're at in different points in their life. Huge kudos to you guys for pointing that out and just giving women the opportunity to, to share their story and you guys being very good listeners and having everybody else hear that out there on the podcast that's listening. Um, and hopefully we will inspire a few women out there or young, young gals that, Hey, realize it's, it's, there's things that they can do. And it's, it's a really good industry to be in. It's always going to be around. It's constantly changing. There's a lot of challenges that are always happening with us. Um, but it's very rewarding. Um, and it's, 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 I just give you guys kudos for putting this together. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you. What you guys that make it the show. I mean, <laughs> I know. And originally day one right brad are we i started i want to do this podcast just so i could talk to you for an hour <laughs> well, thank you and, you know and, you, and then you pointed out that that's about all we talked about last week together <laughs> right so at least yeah. we got that hour man so it's proven out there and then these these people these cool people join us and it's like what how did judy hatchet get here awesome <laughs> yeah it's pretty yeah cool. It's crazy. I can't believe it's been 89 episodes and we haven't missed a week. We have not missed a single week. And uh, it, it used to be a lot of work. It doesn't seem like it's a lot of work anymore. No, no gosh. If you go back and listen to those first like 10 episodes when we were doing it over zoom, 
Ugh. We should just delete those. No, no, no. Those oh, what happened? Right. <laughs> you can't delete those. Yeah. There's a lot of people that I think if you look at the numbers, there's a lot of people have just listened to the first you know, episode and never came back. So yeah. they, they heard it. They're like, yeah, no. But, <laughs> but you know, those, those people, people that are like that, they miss out. They judge the book by its cover. They don't give things the chance to mature, mm -hmm. to blossom, to become something different. Uh, sometimes you stick it out, right? If there's a topic or something, and same thing works with women or men or anybody getting into this industry, don't expect it to go smooth right out of the bat, you know, right out of the gate. You're going to have resistance. You're going to have jerks. You know, we, we all run into them, but stay committed, you know, uh, stick with it. There could be something really, really awesome on the other side. And when you look at people like Judy, you know, I've known, you know, watching her go from, you know, Best Buy to 3M to, uh, well, Super Value was in there somewhere. <laughs> Fairview. Yeah, Fairview. <laughs> and, you know, see where you're at now. It's it's really cool to see people just continue to, to push forward. And I think, and you don't have to say anything publicly, but I, this is probably your your best job you've ever had, Judy. And so yeah. kudos to you. It, it, the other piece of advice, as you were saying, that is women, and not even women, men in general, have to be willing to admit when there's not a good fit. And, you know, um, I think somebody had said, you always get one in your career. And you always go and say, oh, well, that really wasn't a good fit. And you move on to something better. Sometimes things just don't work out. It's not the organization you thought it was. And um, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. You know, it's, you've, you've got to have a culture and an organization that supports you and a culture that you're comfortable with. And um, I am very proud to say that I work for SureScripts. They're an amazing company. They have a lot of really good programs. And what they do is really for the greater good of, you know, for, for people's health across the United States. And so it's, it's really, uh, it is really amazing. Really amazing. That's really cool. And, that, and so for me, knowing you, that coming out of your mouth is, you know, that means something. You know, there's truth and credibility behind those words. Yeah, yeah. It's like you said, if, if it's not, if, if you're not happy, find a job you're happy at. Yep. Mm -hmm. Plenty of opportunities in the industry. So. Very true. All right. Well, thank you, Judy. That was really, that was good. That was very <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and use the word awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank along, you with, guys. along with pizza. We didn't get pizza. <laughs> there it is. Next you have time. to use that in the uh, all hands meeting later, and everybody's going to be like, what is he talking about? Yeah. Yeah. We, we do have that today, don't we? We have the mm -hmm. quarterly meeting. Yeah. It'll be fun. I'm actually letting, not letting, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say letting. That was just bad, poor choice of words. But the, um, uh, Ryan is going to speak on behalf of Security Studio, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to be the commentary. Uh, Very cool. So I, you just keep delegating stuff, and it makes your life so much better. I don't even have to. I don't even have to do anything anymore, except for drive to Indiana. <laughs> yeah, take stay up all night with a puppy. Good. All right. So a couple news stories, and Judy, feel free to chime in. Um, First one is off of, I just grabbed it from Naked Security from Sophos, but it's all over the place, is uh, Sigred and the bug with an impressive name. I like that. I never, I hadn't heard B. Wayne before, but uh, Sigred is a DNS uh, flaw that is warmable. So that's not great considering how many Windows DNS servers are out there. Um, which is crazy. Did you see when it was originally, it, like, how long this bug has been there? 2001, yeah. right? It was like, like 17 or 18 years, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there are a lot more out there, man. There, are, You know, at the more and more complex you make things, the more and more difficult you make it to secure, right? And so if you go by statistics, how many errors per lines of code? is oh. even in a well-run, really well-run shop. What's that? A couple hundred per million lines or something. Yeah, I think it's usually 10 to 15 per thousand lines of code or something oh, like that, okay. per yeah. something in that range. And so when you take something with millions of lines of code, 
there's lots and lots of vulnerabilities, you know, buried in that code. So. Yeah. yeah it, it, I just blew my mind how, how long it's been out there that nobody, nobody found it for that long. Well, you know what the NSA does? NSA has a whole bunch of uh, exploits, right? Yeah. And they'll sit on exploits until it becomes public, and then they'll, then they'll release their code for it. Uh, usually, I mean, that's kind of kind of works that way. Right. And they've been, what was it last year? I think they released a piece of code that they had written in like, you know, in the late nineties. I didn't know that. Yeah, I got to find know that. that uh, but that, I mean, that's because it, it took that long before the world found it. Yeah. So uh, there is a patch out there, uh, and there is a workaround as well. Uh, they are both in that article, uh, registry fixes. But yeah, if, you, if, if it's exploited, they could, you know, the attacker can run arbitrary code in the context of the local system account. On the DNS server? Mm -hmm. On the DNS server. Mm -hmm. So because you said that DHS, I think, uh, had all of their systems. They said they had everything had to be patched by third, Friday Friday at noon. Everything had to be patched. Yeah. yeah, I think I saw CISA had like a 24-hour mm -hmm. requirement for patching. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's not good. Now, how long has the patch been available for it? It, it, it just... Uh, yeah, last uh, last Tuesday. Okay. So they, they released it, 123 bugs for Patch Tuesday with 20 criticals. And this one is a 10 on the CVSS. So patch your systems, please. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Next one is off Info Security Magazine. Um, this will be interesting to follow. Uh, last Was it last week, two weeks ago? Last week, there was a ruling by the European Union, like Supreme Court, that Privacy Shield is uh, invalid. So companies with in the US or well, com companies in the EU doing business with companies in the US, it's, it's going to be a really, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens here, because this is the whole, this was you know, allowing or protecting liability, you know, and now they're saying, nope, it doesn't work. You gotta, you, you have to comply. And the U.S. doesn't have the same security requirements and data protection as the EU does. Yeah, you gotta give the EU some credit. I mean, they identify, they, they certainly understand that, um, you know, you're always strong as your weakest link. And in the, in this case, some of the weakest links are U.S. companies and the way they're handling data. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, you know, so the way private, Privacy Shield, I mean, hasn't Privacy Shield kind of always been invalid? I mean, in my opinion. Well, it's I mean. It's capable. It, oh, for sure. But it was still the law, so you had some protection. And it was valid from the legal perspective and the compliance perspective, but from a security perspective, it was always invalid in, oh. my, in my mind. Well, I mean, it was basically a pass to not have the security requirements met. Right. So. But if you tell us, you do. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Things like, you know, you think about the regular, you know, smaller companies that think about, you know, like the Facebooks and the Googles and Twitter and whatever, whoever, that's, I mean, this is going to be a massive change in how they do business, which hopefully is good for consumers. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see. They'll find, <laughs> I just, I have so little, um, it, the they find ways around things and they, they manipulate, Oh, I checked the box and then it's all argued in court and I don't know. It's just a pain. If people just do the right thing from the beginning, it would make life a lot easier. Yeah, but it's hard, Evan. <laughs> yeah. It's There's... hard when it's after the fact. It's not hard when we're at the table. <laughs> right. Very true. I love when my kids used to say, used to use that excuse. Well, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can, I can show you some, something hard. <laughs> 
All right, uh, last one is uh, again from InfoSec uh, Magazine. Russian APT crew actively targets COVID-19 vaccine developers. I mean, uh, it, yeah, I, I wasn't really surprised. It's probably not just, this is Cozy Bear uh, that is the group. I'm pretty sure it's probably not just them, but it's kind of, I don't know. Like, there's, there's a lot of state sponsored stuff going after yeah. This data too. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, you you only hope that they are not negatively impacting the the research by doing this. But this has been going on. It's not just Russia, like like Evan said. This has been going on yeah. for probably like what six, eight weeks or so right now. That they've been. I know some nation state have been targeting it too. We've been reading mm -hmm. about this for quite a while. So just a bummer. <laughs> well, you know, but. If they're going after it, it doesn't mean that you can't defend against it. If you know specifically what you're, what you, if I know specifically what it is you're targeting, mm -hmm. that's really good intelligence for how I would design defenses against that, right? That's a good point. So, so hopefully these things are, you know, multiple layers of air gapped. Uh, why would you even have it connected to the internet at all if you don't need to? You know, what I mean, well, it, yeah, yeah, that's a good question, and I, I, I don't know enough about it to say. You know, is it, are they doing any sort of data sharing with other researchers, you know, but. Well, and, you know, Judy, with her, with your multiple nights of non-sleep, you know, isolate these networks. I mean, mm -hmm. you should know every single thing going in and out of a network with something this sensitive, right? Your data flow should be iron tight. You should be default deny everywhere, right? So you can, I think, protect against it. And hopefully the government is helping too. Like if the government knows where this research is being conducted, that they're helping out. Yeah, I would hope so. Yeah, they actually are. Um, Chris from the DHS reached out to me uh, shortly after I started SureScripts and wanted to talk to my predecessor at Fairview because they were reaching out to all the healthcare and, and also at the University of Minnesota and saying, hey, we wanna go talk to them. We wanna tell them what we're seeing. We wanna make them aware of what to expect. So they are, they're definitely reaching out uh, through the different organizations to get the word out to say, here's what you need to do. So. That's good. That's good. Russian, yeah. Yeah, that sucks. But I think we can, I, I like when the, when the focus is that narrow. True. Sure. When I know specifically what you're coming after, I guess it makes it a little easier. Yeah. Very true. Uh, and then the last one, I, we're not going to really talk about it. It's been talked about to death, I think, over the last week, but the Twitter hack on Wednesday with the mm -hmm. people getting in. The, it, I don't know if you read that, but it's, he actually has a really good write-up of uh, a lot of the technical background and what the what happened. I, I just thought it, was a, it might be interesting to, for people to read. You know, the, big, the biggest frustration about the Twitter act is the just our our industry sensationalizes way too many things. We push the big alarm button way too many times. And the thing is, normal people, people that aren't in this industry aren't paying attention to us anymore because we've cried wolf so many damn times. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny how something like the Twitter one was, you know, it was nation state, you know, this is a, a buildup for, you know, the, the November attack. And it's like, what the mm. hell are you talking about? No. What, what evidence do you have to support any of that? Because it looks to me like you had some guys who kind of stumbled on something. Uh, we're looking for some money and they got maybe 300, 400 victims out of it, out of a potential of many hundreds of millions. Right. Well, and, and going after these big names, it could, it's like a, badge for them right like a hey look what i did i got you know they they were interviewed the one who has at six number six and so this is a you know this is what they try to do it's how they make a name for themselves is going after these well-known accounts that are verified so yeah I, I it was clearly a money money grab yeah, well, I read some article. I read one article. It was like, this has national security implications. And it's like, yeah, you're stretching a little bit. And then it's uh, you know, you global. Know, you can cause global instability. 
It's like, well, seriously? I mean, I could see if, if you know, um, let's just say Trump's Twitter got hacked, right? If they had gotten Trump and he had, they tweeted out something about nuclear war or something like that, I could see that causing panic, you know? But yeah, I'm with you. It's overblown. I saw that if anything, I saw this and that's what I said in my interview is, Oh yeah. This is success. In my opinion, when you had this, did this few people fell for that attack? Gosh, Gosh, considering the total number of followers. I mean, what's the percentage on that? If I got that kind of click percentage on my own phishing attack, you know? Yeah. So I, I'm always looking for like positive things too to share with. I call them normal people and people get offended sometimes about that, but call them everyday average people, people who aren't in our industry. Every time you can find something to be, to point to success for them, to encourage them rather than constantly beating them with a, a stick on, you know, all the sensational stuff happens in our industry, I think the better. So I like the fact that we only had 383 transactions that were. Well, yeah. Well, Be- Bezos himself has over 1.5 million followers, right? right? So, I mean, you're looking at, such a small fraction of a percentage. It was, it was good money for one day, but it really was not that big of a yeah. win. It really yeah. wasn't. I mean, and, and Evan, you alluded to that in the interview too. It was like, it's was small. Yeah. Yeah. And I like positive stuff. We have positive reinforcement, you know, was that, you remember psychology in, in college? Oh yeah. Where you either feed the dog or shock the dog. Well, who was that? Was it? Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Havlov? I don't know. I can't remember. I don't do that stuff, but. Yeah. It's the, it's the positive fun. reinforcement and negative reinforcement, right? There's a couple of different ways to motivate people to do things and look for the positive, I guess. Yep. With you. All right. Well, that's it for episode 89. Thank you, Judy. This was a great installment um, of the Women in Security series. Either of you have shout outs this week, Evan? I'm going to give a shout out to just uh, kind of the whole FR Secure leadership. You know, I get the opportunity to talk to them. Uh, and I'm saying leadership minus me. I get to talk to those guys uh, every week. And uh, they're just awesome. You know, Renee, Vinay, John. I also get to talk to Peter. So I don't know. It's Peter. <laughs> Poor Peter. I know. I love Peter. Peter's awesome. He's the guy that encourages me every Wednesday. But just a shout out to those guys. They're doing a great job. Yep. Judy, any, any shout outs? Yeah, just a couple. I'll give a shout out back to Lori Blair for taking the time. Again, you know, it's investing that time to really help somebody else get into the industry and give them some words of advice and, and take the, you know, just build them up. Uh, shout out to my friend and mentor, John Valente, because I know I would not be here if it wasn't for him and him believing in me and considering continuing to support me and coach me. Um, and then again, to you guys for putting this on, I just really think it's a great effort for, um, for women in security in general. So. Thank you. Well, yeah. And I got one this week, I was thinking about, you know, talking to some people and over the weekend and, you know, talking with all the women about how we got started into security. So I'll, I'll give a shout out to uh, Kevin Bruce, who was CIO at one of the places. He's the one who paid for, got, it let, got me into the initial CISSP training that I did in like 2011 12 something like that so shout out to him yeah supporting that so well by proxy i'll give a shout out to him too because now you're here yeah 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 so um all right thank you to all our listeners thank you very much keep the questions and feedback coming uh send them to us by email at unsecurity at protonmail.com if you're the show, social type man i can't talk Socialize with us on Twitter. I'm at Brad and I. Evan is at Evan Francine. And Judy, is there any way, uh, particular way you want people to find you? Actually, I don't do Twitter. I stay off of all of that. I like to read everything, but I stay off of it as much as I can. So, If, if you look at my account, it's very rare that I actually say anything. I use it basically as like a n- aggregator. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if you want to reach out to Judy, email us and we can get in touch with her. Um, or, or go through the channels at SureScripts. You know, 
I'm, I'm super happy for you, Judy, yeah. that you're in a place where you're well supported and it sounds like a great company making a big difference. So shout out to SureScripts too. You got a good one. Thank you. All right. Lastly, be sure to follow Security Studio at Studio Security and FR Secure at FR Secure for more goodies. That's it. And talk to everyone next week.